Hi, David Bizard here, and you are watching PowerTech 10. Give me a few minutes of your time, and I will give you the benefit of 50 years of winning a race engine building and high performance street motors. The subject of today's video is bearing clearances. So we go through pretty much the same procedure with all the mains caps that we've done with the number one and number five. I have all the caps off except the one I'm checking. I will check number two, take that cap off, check number three, take that cap off, check number four, take that cap off. This is about what I'm doing now. So we'll just see what this one is. As it happens, our clearances came out pretty good. Back one was 3.1. This was the tightest one. It was about 2.4 thousandths. I wanted two and a half. So I just wiped over the bearing shell to make sure that everything was clean and it'd have to go for that. This one here was uh, about 2.6. And this one here was... That was about 2.6 as well. Right, so we're looking good. Everything is within tolerance, except this one was about a tenth tight. Well, I'm going to leave that and see if I can address that later on during the assembly. Well, that's all the bearing clearance is done on the mains. It's all assembled, torqued down, and lubed with pre build lube right another word for it is trial build lube so let's see how easy it turns over how about that for low friction now i'd like to say this is all due to uh, my efforts building it but to be honest it wouldn't turn over like this if it wasn't for the precision machining done up at terry walters uh, machine shop in Roanoke. Terry is an ex-pro stock guy. You go in there and you want a high performance engine, he goes to a lot of trouble to make sure you get pro stock standards when it's done for a performance engine like this. Thanks Terry. Well so much for the main bearings. It's time to do the rod bearings now. I know someone's going to ask why didn't I do the rod bearings first, especially after they see it involves taking the crank back out. It's quite simple. I did this video over a period of about four or five days. The rod bearings weren't in, but the main bearings were. So I did it that way. So now you know. Ordinarily, I would do the rods first, then the mains. So here we go on the rods. When I'm building engines in my shop here and with my students, one of the things that we always do is to check the big end bore size here, right? We don't do that just with scat rods. We do that with any rods, be they Corello, Crower, whatever, right? And uh, occasionally you'll find, or we find that some are slightly out of tolerance. So we rectify that. These scat rods are all intolerant, and what I want to do now is raise a couple of points concerning these rods. First off, the cap and the beam are numbered. So those numbers go together so you know that the cap is on the right way round. Right? Another telltale sign is the chamfer here. This big chamfer goes towards the cheek of the crank, right? and the small chamfer goes towards the cheek of the rod and lastly it's got two uh, bearing uh, cutouts here they are both on the same side 
Right, so now let's uh, take a look at uh, what we did with these rods to prep them for doing our bearing clearances. Our next move is to separate the cap of the rod from the main uh, shank of it here. Now, a, a little bit on these rods first. I've covered these uh, scat rods in pretty much detail in previous videos, but just to recap on that, these are not expensive rods. They're, they're kind of the scat's middle of the road rod. They're almost indestructible. I've used 800 horsepower on them, never failed a rod. We've had nitrous motors making 1300 horsepower. Right, the bro block broke, but the rods didn't. They, they bent, but they didn't break. Now, uh, okay, back to business here. Now, when you get these rods, the caps are torqued down to about 65 so they can hone this to size. So, you are going to need a fairly big wrench to get them undone. Also, I've been promising myself a rod vice for 40 years and I've just never got one. What I do is I tape up the jaws of the vise with uh, something like Gorilla Tape, two layers of it, and I can fit the rod in there for the purposes of undoing it. So that's what I'll do now. <coughs> now for the hard part. Right, I say hard part, isn't it? Bit of talking. <sighs> got it. Mm, yeah, got it. Right. Right, so that's unbolted the rod. Now, since it's got two dowels locating the, the two halves, which are pretty much a press fit to make sure they locate in the same place every time, we need to use a mallet to separate the two. Here's how we do it. Put the rod in the vise holding on to just the cap. Take a hold of this. Done. What we're doing at this point is just taking the sharp edge off here. When you split these rods you'll find that there is just a little burr all the way around left from the machining. Now, the chamfering we do here has to be very minimal, right? Because the press fit will squeeze out into that groove. Now, I don't know at what point this does, but I've been told by people who design bearings that this is what happens. Now, I can't imagine that a 5,000 chamfer is going to do anything there. Now when we come to the corners here, always go down like this with a round file, right? Away from the machined edge and then just shave off these edges here and we're done. Do that on the cap and on the main part of the rod beam. After we've deburred our rods, the next job is to clean the bearings. As with the mains, this has to be a meticulous job. Let me show you what I mean in terms of cleaning them. As with the mains, I'm using cleavite bearings here. And uh, these have what appears to be a finish coating on. Now, it's important that you don't remove that whatever that top layer is but it is important that you get the bearing clean now if you look very carefully you will see that I have cleaned the bearing on the left to the point where it it actually is shiny you'll know when you've got to enough cleaning because the bearing will feel as smooth as ice what do I use to clean it as usual a paper towel a lot of vigorous rubbing on the bearing and lacquer thinner. 
Before we wind up on the subject of bearing shells, last couple of points. Stone off the numbers, or at least stone over that to see if they're raised at all. Uh, just in case I forget, after you've stoned the bearings, grit can get into these here. A good way to make sure you've got it all is a powerful cleaner, uh, a degreaser. Um, Harbor Freight has one in, in gallon cans, but there's others out there that'll do it. And a paintbrush that's had the bristles cut right down to only a, about that much. So stone those off. And then the last thing is, is just break the sharp edge there with a chamfer, which is about five thousandths. Now I'm going to tell you something about bearings here. And I've measured the thickness of these bearings, right? First off, there's an upper and a lower, right? With the cleavite bearings, the lower bearing is usually thinner. That means it has a couple of tenths more clearance if we assume a perfect circle. Secondly, all high performance bearings and probably all bearings by now, the wall of the bearing is thinner at the edges here. And what that does is it allows for the big end bearing to distort. And the irony is since this has come into being, and I think Smoky Unit was the one that brought this into popular use, is that rod uh, journals have got more robust, so it's now not needed as much. But back when Smokey was pioneering high performance in NASCAR stuff, the rods were distorting and scraping the oil off of the sharp edge. Just to make sure that does not happen, I don't know if you can see it, the shine, I've just put a little chamfer on there, right? So the bearings have been chamfered, deep, bumped on the numbers, cleaned, polished, and we are ready to go. Okay, long-winded though it's been, we are now ready to actually check the clearance on the big ends. Follow this procedure and it all goes smoothly. Do it without following this procedure and you could be struggling. First move is to position the crank on the bench with the journal that you're going to work on in this position here. You'll see why in a moment. Next, totally degrease the rod journal. Then place, usually takes the green strip, place your plastic gauge on here and hold it in place by pressing on each end with the screwdriver, right? That will glue it in place and that's the reason we want it oil free. Put just a drop of that trial lube that I uh, talked about earlier on, onto the bearing and just with your finger, wipe it over the bearing, right? You do not want any thickness there. You just want a slippery bearing, right? Why do we want this? Because we do not want the plastic gauge to stick to this, especially if we inadvertently move the rods whilst we're checking it. Next, position a rod on the journal, right, making sure the big chamfer is towards this side here. Let it rest on the bench. You'll start to see why we needed it in this position. You'll notice that the plastic gauge is in the middle here. Remember, we've got more clearance here and here on these bearings. We check the bearing clearance right in the middle. Next, position this one here, being careful not to touch anything on the rod. Once you have the rods bolted in place, right, and just snug these bolts up, put 
feeler gauges that are a tight fit in here. That's to stop the assembly doing this when you torque it up. Right, so uh, that's what we'll do next, is torque up those bolts. At this point, we can torque up the rods like so. It's best to have somebody hanging on to the other end of the crank when you're doing this. It makes life a lot easier. Just go around and untorque all the bearings. A check of the uh, widths here show that we have Right on two thousandths clearance. Right, maybe on the, uh, this next one here, just a fraction over, probably 2.1, 2.2. So we're good. Well, that about wraps up our bearing clearances on the cheap. One thing before we finished. Somebody is going to ask, how accurate is this uh, plastic gauge? Well, there's an easy way you can check that for yourself. Just get two precision ground plates, two feeler gauges, the same size, say two, two thousandths thickness, put a piece of the plastic gauge, the green stuff, between the two feeler gauges, squeeze the plates together, if it doesn't come out reading two thousandths, it's wrong. If you do that test, you'll find that it reads two thousandths really close. Now, it may not be as accurate when we start getting to the extremes. However, this is the good thing about it. It's accurate enough to always tell you when you've got a problem. If it measures out looking about what you needed, the chances are it is pretty much about what you needed. Do we do our stuff in the shop using plastic gauge? No, it's actually faster to do it with gauges like a, uh, uh, a bore dial indicator and micrometers and write down all the clearances. But anyway, you'll get to that stage when you're a professional race engine builder. So if you liked what you saw on this uh, um, uh, video then please hit the like and please subscribe it costs a lot of time and money to do these videos we need to have we need to justify that time and money with our audience thank you Thank you.